Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, look, it's, it's a good question because, yeah, one of the strange things that uh, Bob Brown, Natasha Stottlespoyer and Margaret Thatcher have in common is, of course, that they all accept uh, climate change. And it's an even better question because in Australia we have this sort of, well, historically unique situation where we have the, the, the Greens and the Labor Party pushing a market-based mechanism to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Again, one that the economists who may or may not be in on the conspiracy all agree is by far the cheapest way to address this problem. While we have the Conservative Party in Australia proposing the direct action scheme, which uh, we've estimated in order to achieve the 700, billion do uh, 700 million tonnes of abatement that the Liberal Party have said is their goal, which is, of course, the same goal as the Gillard government, it's just how we're going to get there, um, that uh, we estimate there would be 150,000 grant applications required to achieve that 700 million tonnes of abatement. That is, uh, under the direct action scheme, companies will fill out a form, say, here's how I'd like to reduce emissions, send it to Canberra and a bureaucrat will read it and give it a score out of 10 and we'll come up with our favourite ones. Uh, we're going to literally require an army of bureaucrats to implement the direct action scheme. So in terms of political... I think climate change doesn't fit in the old left right of politics. That's why <laughs> that old lefty Arnold Schwarzenegger was so keen on it. Um, it doesn't fit in the politics... Uh, with the economics and the science uh, both suggest that we should act and uh, that the best way to act is, is through a carbon price. But again, I just don't understand why the sceptics who say they're worried about the cost of action are so unconcerned about the very high cost of the, the Abbott proposal of direct action. Again, they both want the same target. They're both proposing 5%. It's just how do we get there? Thanks. Next question from Simon Gross. Simon Gross from Science Media. Last week in the north of this town, we had an attack by some Greenpeace activists on a GM, uh, an experimental uh, plot of GM wheat. It reminded me of the, of the symmetry between the public attitudes and acceptance or lack of uh, when it comes to climate science and when it comes to GM plant science. In both cases, we have uh, very strong scientific consensus. And in both cases, we have a small minority of uh, people who are seen to be sceptics, deniers, ratbags, iconoclasts. Um, so I just want to ask both of you, why is it uh, uncool to be a climate science denier, but it's cool to be a GM science denier? Richard? Oh, look, very good question. Um, why isn't it cool to deny that the, you know, uh, that the sun causes skin cancer? Why isn't it cool to deny that immunisation protects our children from whooping cough? Uh, why isn't it cool uh, for any number of the conspiracies that you can find on the, on the websites uh, that suggest that all the science is wrong and some herbal remedy is right? Um, why don't we give that 50% of the editorial space in newspapers? Why don't we go and find the people that think that immunisation is causing disease, not protecting children, and give them 50% of the space on opinion pages? I, I mean, it's a fascinating question. Why have we taken scepticism about climate science and said that, sure, it might be a minority opinion, sure, the overwhelming majority of scientists uh, might, uh, might have uh, reached... Uh, settled conclusions based on data, uh, you know, the, the, we're talking about data that needs to be rejected here, not just models. Um, why is it that as a society we've placed climate scepticism on a pedestal, yet common sense tells us that, uh, yes, we understand why people might be concerned about GM crops, but we dismiss them as quirky. Yes, we understand why people might be uh, concerned with immunisation, but without a strong scientific basis, as opposed to a really strongly held opinion, we just don't put them up on a press club uh, address. You know, I've never seen the immunisation sceptics here at the press club. <laughs> Well, hey, baby, I think that climate science scepticism is cool. <laughs> and 
I think we ought to just mention a little bit about the history of Greenpeace, because it was founded, among others, by a friend of mine, the late Eric Ellington, who sadly died earlier this year. Now, Eric was a lovely man. He was totally non-political. He, like Patrick Moore and the other founders of Greenpeace, were true carers for the environment. They loved nature. They didn't want us to despoil it. They wanted to raise our consciousness of it. And they established Greenpeace to do just that. And with great sadness, this entirely non-political person said to me one day that he and many of his fellow founders of Greenpeace had had to leave the organization after a few years because, and this is how he put it, it had been taken over by Marxists who had not the slightest interest in the environment but were willing to use it as a pretext for continuing the battle to bring down the West. So there is, and this was, this was one of the founders of Greenpeace, this is what he said. He's not the only one. Patrick Moore has publicly said what Eric has said to me privately. There is a feeling that these environmental movements have been captured by political forces who are not necessarily friendly to the West and our way of life. So that's one side of it. But then, as far as GM science is concerned, genetic modification has been practiced for decades in, in crops and has led, among other things, for instance, to what used to be called miracle rice, when I was a lad learning about this in school. And we were taught to admire this because of the greater yields that the rice could achieve, and therefore the many starving people in Africa would be saved from uh, suffering. So I think that what we've got to get back to is true science, whether it's for GM crops or whether it's the climate. No more of this nonsense about consensus. Back to the equations. Well, Martin, if I may... If I may ask a follow-on question uh, following that, I, I heard you this morning on radio, and from my recollection is that you uh, you articulated that view about the about Greenpeace. Uh, my recollection is that you also uh, suggested that the Greens, both in Europe and in this country, had been effectively hijacked by uh, by Marxists and the like who had an economic agenda. Do you is is that a view that you hold about the Greens in this country that they? predominantly have an economic agenda, which is to, as I think you put it, to destroy the West. Let me suggest how you can study this question scientifically. <laughs> Read the Communist Manifesto. It is available online. Read the manifestos of the European Communist parties in the post-war period. Read the manifesto of your own Green Party. And, sir, go figure. <laughs> I'll ask Richard, as a, as a former advisor to Bob Brown, to respond. Well, I, I encourage you to do exactly that. I would go to the website and read both. Um, but, look, of course, the main point is that this conspiracy runs far deeper than the communist takeover of Greenpeace because Malcolm Turnbull and John Howard and Marius Kloppitz and Ralph Hillman, the head of the Coal Association, are in on it. <laughs> OK, we just really need an explanation here of what is it that's driving the head of BHP to accept this and why is Woodside using climate science to predict how much stronger its gas rigs will need to be to resist the climate change that their gas is going to cause? Next, next question, Andrew Tillett. Andrew Tillett, The West Australian. A question for both of you, uh, just about the tone of the debate about uh, climate change, not the one here, but in the wider community, um, where it seems to degenerate into a lot of uh, name-calling and mudslinging on both sides. And, um, I mean, we had, uh, like, Lord Monckton's beginning of the trip, you were sort of overshadowed with the, the comments about uh, Professor Garno, which you subsequently apologised for, but that prompted someone like Malcolm Turnbull to call you a rather sick vaudeville character. We, we have... We... Hey, that's better than he manages. <laughs> um, yeah, I just... Yeah, just, just are we getting, is there going to be any hope of getting a more civilised tone to this debate, or, or has it become too polarised? Yeah. 
I'll, I'll ask Richard to respond civilly. Um, <laughs> I'll start now. Um, look, look. Thanks for the question, and uh, and I think it's it's deeply concerning. I mean, I hope that uh, that Lord Monckton is right about climate change. I hope that he is right, but I I fear that he's not, and that fear is based on science, and that fear is based on evidence. And and I think that as a society, as a democratic society, we have to respect each other's points of view. And I'm I'm deeply concerned that uh, that climate scientists in Australia have received death threats. I'm deeply concerned that someone wielded a noose in front of a climate scientist in Melbourne last week. I'm deeply concerned that someone uh, spoke at a rally in Queensland recently and said, do you understand why we feel like taking arms up against this government? Because in a democracy, you should make the case, you should debate the case for why you believe you are right and you should accept the consequences in a democracy of when others don't agree with you. So I'm terrified... Uh, that in Australia at the moment we are creating a temperature in which, while we, ostensibly we're having a debate about climate science, there are people whipping up fundamental problems uh, for our democracy, and that is the respect to agree with other people even when you are in the minority. And if a majority agrees to act in a democracy, we go along with it. We don't brandish nooses at people. First of all, ladies and gentlemen of the press, I hope that you would regard us as conducting a civilised debate here, and I should certainly like at this point to pay tribute to my opponent in this debate, who has conducted himself in an entirely civilised fashion, and I am going to try to do the same. So, can we give him a round of applause? Now, I am concerned that three weeks before I arrived in Australia, one of your journalists said that climate sceptics should be branded with tattoos. I am concerned that two weeks before I came to Australia, one of your journalists on a leading national newspaper, in that national newspaper, said that climate sceptics should be gassed. Now, I wonder what kind of a regime it was that used to do that to its opponents. And... What I'm particularly concerned about, ladies and gentlemen of the press, is that you have quite rightly called me out for a single, inadvertent, crass remark for which I have completely and abjectly and humbly and unreservedly apologised, and I renew that apology now, and yet you have not asked your own number who have done similar things, in fact worse things, to apologise. And, Andrew, you say you work for the West Australian. Was this the paper whose headline a couple of weeks ago was Ban the Lord, with a large picture of me? Was that a civilised tone? I'm not sure that it was. So let us all agree that in future this debate should be conducted at a more scientific level. It is not enough to wave our arms and say the science is clear when the climate is a chaotic object and therefore the science can never be clear. It's not good enough to say the science is clear because there's a consensus, because consensus is not the way science is done. Science is done by hard work, hard research, checking, checking and checking again. Back to those equations again.